everyone. Um, welcome to this um, next in the Bartlett Real Estate Institute lecture series. Um, I'm Joss Boys. I work at the Real Estate Institute and I have a remit, I guess, for what I would think of as equality, diversity and inclusion, a diversity and inclusion and for community engagement. I'm also course director for the Masters in Learning Environments. Um, today, I have great pleasure in introducing G. Sinha. He's the director of Reef Space Projects, which he founded in 2015. As you may know, he's been developing a model for reusing empty buildings that can be easily replicated and adapted to different circumstances. And the aim of that, um, it's uh, to have a socially productive and effective way of dealing with waste and in inequality by sharing and reusing resources. So through a series of iterations, really concrete examples, which G I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, this is a model I think that has huge potential to create positive change and lasting impact. And it's often done really with very little funding. Uh, and ultimately we're thinking about how space and resources can be used to make a better city uh, instead of just a better project, a profit. Um, I met G through a UCL funded, uh, UCL culture funded project, um, and we were looking, uh, it got rather stymied by the pandemic, but we were looking at what a community university partnership might look like within um, construction and project management, uh, where people working at the university and more widely could connect with community groups, but in a way that was connected very much with ideas of mutual aid and volunteering rather than more conventional um, research uh, programs. So um, I'm really looking forward to hearing his talk. Um, just so everybody knows this talk is being recorded uh, and we would love it. There is a, a Q and A function. So we'd be very happy for you to put questions into the chat. Uh, and if you'd like to ask correct questions directly of G at the end, then you're also welcome just to do that by raising your hand. So, um, uh, G, over to you. I'm going to um, start your presentation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Joss uh, and Vasek for inviting me. Uh, I'm really honoured to be speaking here at the Bartlett Institute. Again. Um, as Josh says, we uh, we embarked upon quite an exciting project um, around about this time last year, um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to finding out what we can what we can potentially do together in the future. So um, I'll just I'll just crack straight on. Why don't I? So let me tell you a little bit about this organisation, Free Space Project, that I. Um, been involved in since 2015. Joss actually summed it up beautifully uh, in your interview, uh, in your introduction, um, because ultimately we are just really trying to create a valid and a, uh, a replicable system uh, of reuse of not only empty buildings, but also of wasted materials, of food, of building materials, clothes, technology, furniture, down to even skills and time and trying to find ways to use all of these different available resources um, to perhaps prove that while we might seem that we're not um, living through the most abundant of times, actually there are an abundance of resources that are being wasted every single day. And so in 2015, we started with the concept of respacing. Now, respacing is essentially, I mean, the, the definition is up there. It just basically means reusing empty buildings and wasted resources for social good, using the space as a conduit for innovation, for creativity, for whatever. Uh, some of our links are up there. You can check out our website um, and our social media later on. Um, but I want to talk to you about our system of change. Next slide. Uh, Joss, I don't think you're sharing the presentation. Uh, I'm sorry about that because I can see it. And it's the only thing I can see on my screen. Is that working? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, just... Great. Cool. Yeah. So um, that's, the, that's the first slide. Yep. 
so um, I mean, I'll apologise straight away for the the um, the kind of slight errors in the the text that for some reason it didn't convert across properly. Um, but essentially, this is the this is the mission of Respace. We reuse waste to reduce inequality and rebuild community, and we have a replicable system by which we can do that. And one of the main and most important parts of our mission is to try and create a formula, a model that is easily um, transferable from one area to another, that can easily be taken on by local groups, understood, and then implemented. Next slide. And so over the last five years, we've tech, taken on seven major projects while simultaneously helping other small groups find buildings, find spaces or, or formulate themselves. And what we generally tend to do with our projects is uh, we curate them. So by that token, what we do is we find local groups and uh, small businesses, community groups, social enterprises who are in desperate need of space, who are not getting the support that they might normally would, would like to get, who perhaps can't quite get access to the funding that they would want. And by integrating them, curating them and getting them to work together on collaborative projects, we've been able to facilitate seven different projects in seven different areas, mostly of London, but we've also branched out to Peterborough, to South End, to Leicester and, and other areas. And you can see here some of the photos of different projects that we worked on and the, the logos, each project, each space is an independent autonomous, uh, is independent and autonomous. And so one of the main things that that does is it creates a strong sense of ownership within those communities for those periods of time and for those projects. All of these spaces were unused and empty uh, and the developer, the owner, was at that particular moment unable to use their space in a way that was generating them profit and it was becoming a cost. And by doing what we have done, by showing and by implementing the, the, the holistic urban regeneration system that we have created, we've been able to have seven successful projects that have had a number of extensions to their, to their timescale. Next slide. And along the way, what this has done it's led to us receiving you know, a number of a number of wonderful things. We've had a lot of media attention. Um, we've received our own radio show. We've had testimonials from politicians, from academics, the likes of Noam Chomsky, etc. Um, we've even featured in a, a textbook uh, about strategy, talking about our social innovation strategy and highlighting that the key thing about Respace is not so much that we are trying to do anything brand new, because obviously you know, these sorts of ideas have existed for a long time, but more that we're able to, and we are creating a system which can connect existing ideas, existing innovations in new and innovative ways. And we've even got our own radio show. And this has recently led to last year us winning the Sustainable City Overall Awards for 2019 and 20, um, and now 2021. Um, for, for the rep replicability and for the, for the the low cost of our of our model. Next next slide. Now what this has led to us understanding and doing is to to fully realise in any individual area the the potential within the community there. There needs to be some form of network, some form of mutual aid network. And, you know, this, this concept of a mutual aid network has become so intrinsic to our way of thinking since, you know, the events, as we all know, of the last year has led to mutual aid becoming one of the most vital, vital components that has helped, you know, millions of people make it through one of the most difficult times, I think, that we've, we've experienced in our lives. And so... What we decided to do now, this was decided actually before COVID, and it, it is partly because of this that we we came um, to work with Bartlett's because it's a fairly it's a fairly 
straightforward and obvious idea that an alliance, which is basically just a family of groups and organizations committed to a, a common goal. And in our case, that common goal is sort of social good. It's climate change, it's you know, climate mitigation. So the idea of an alliance is, is pre-established, but we are developing and working on and growing our grassroots alliance but what makes it quite unique and what we're really excited about is the number of high level developers and councils and authority that have and, and universities. We're, we're so honored um, to be working with UCL that have shown that they have a real interest in being in contact with working with the grassroots organizations that we've been so successful with integrating. And so the alliance is a. a a growing organization that will soon be formulated into a, 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 a an incorporated body um, and that's something that we'll be keeping you up to date with as we go along and what's particularly exciting is to talk a little bit about how we met Bartlett uh, and how we met Joss was through this um, forum that she mentioned the idea that some form of platform that linked universities, academics, students, social groups, small businesses, local enterprises together so that they could share knowledge, so that they could share information and resources was something that was being cried out for by, you know, from what we could see, pretty much everybody who was attending these forums. And yet there is no single galvanizing um, product or or technology or platform that brings everybody together to do that. And that was something that we started the process of, uh, of starting to create. Next slide. Now, one of, the, one of the key parts that makes the seven projects so successful and what makes the Respace mission, I think, unique is our holistic urban regeneration system. And what that really means, if you break it down, is simply the idea that you can regenerate an area, but you can do it in such a way that everybody benefits. And our very, um, our very festival friendly graphic sort of illustrates that principle um, in a, in a time honored old way, because essentially what we're doing with our spaces is we're turning them into hubs. And those hubs are the, the hexagon things that you see in the middle, they are in local areas and they connect and transfer resources, knowledge and ideas, not only between the flowers, which are, you know, different small projects or, or businesses, but also between each other. So that should, you know, um, a, a massive amount of furniture become available because it's being thrown out of one area, but it's not necessary or not needed by anybody in that area at that time. It can be smoothly moved over to another project that might similarly need those materials. And this connectivity, this network, but this actual physical expression of a digital platform is incredibly powerful and it leads to a huge number of benefits. Next slide. Are you still there? Next slide. Have I stopped? I can't tell. There you go. So <laughs> talking about the benefits, one of the most important things that we have learned in our journey is, is that benefits are a very difficult thing for social organizations, for social groups, uh, and for people who are trying to make a, a difference. It's a very difficult thing for them to be able to illustrate or highlight, you know, the different types of benefit, the different more subtle things that are perhaps not easily transferable into statistics. Things like, you know, environmental behaviors improving or you know, knowledge being spread through um, knowledge of your know, current politics or climate change or, you know, new techniques or even, you know, fixing and building. These are very difficult things to to assess and to assess to measure the impact of 
And so we spend, with each one of our projects, what we've tried to do is we've tried to measure those impacts in as many different ways as we possibly can. And, you know, um, we've produced a number of different impact reports for a variety of different models of operation, all of which can show the different the different things, the different innovations, the different ideas that can be expressed through the simple principle of reusing space in this holistic way that not only saves developers and councils and authorities and the owners of these spaces massive amounts of money, but also saves money for the community groups and uh, the social enterprises and the small businesses and those creatives who just need access to resources. And it therefore multiplied by many times their ability to produce the results that they're trying to trying to produce. In the case of charities that we've worked with, by saving huge amounts of money working with free space, using the empty building, and trading their knowledge and experience in return for resources, they were able to lower their costs to the point where they were able to deliver far, far higher um, numbers, far, far, far better returns and better service which we also you know, consider to be a very important impact of sharing space, of, of a, a system of commons sharing, as well as a system of commons ownership. Next slide. Now, we've been doing this for five years, since 2015. We developed this system because we realized that in times of crisis, in times of emergency, those people at the very bottom were often excluded were often unable to be able to even have access to the very basic resources they might need to survive. And nothing has shown this more clearly, I think, on a global scale than just, you know, this tiny little, this tiny little virus that brought the whole world to its, its knees and put everybody into some, into some form of, you know, terrible situation. And the number of people who have been excluded grows every single day. You know, the government has tried very hard and, and people try very hard to make sure there's food, to make sure that there's services. But the reality is 10 million people in this country have been excluded and not received any support in any way to get through this most difficult of times. Now, we developed our system as a mutual aid hub system. And then when COVID struck, what was really, what was really impressive and one of the things that we've, we've actually detailed in a report we've created just specifically about our, our mutual aid project is that on the day that lockdown came we were already ready we have an agile system and it became very clear that space was going to be needed to provide emergency services emergency food emergency well-being emergency advice and there were organizations and there were mutual aid groups springing up while professional organizations and governmental organizations were still coming to terms with it, mutual aid groups were fast and agile and quick to set up, quick to get moving, quick to jump on their bikes. And so we used our space and flipped it in a matter of a few days from a, a social enterprise center that was providing space for artisans, craftspeople, and, and um, you know, green businesses within the local area, immediately into a food and emergency services hub which meant that we were able to, starting with just a couple of hundred meals that we were giving out for free, eventually the system grew organically to be delivering something like 20,000 plus meals in total in the North London area, specifically working with drug dependency agencies and uh, homeless agencies to make sure that the emergency provisions that were put in place for the timescale that it would take for them to get going, people would have died. But in that meantime period, we knew that there were families, and you can see some of the numbers there, who desperately needed supporting. And so we did our best to not only support them, but also to expand the system. And then as lockdown passed uh, and ended, we passed on the resources, whether that be fridges, whether that be food, and giant freezers, and contacts, and volunteers, to other organizations that had sprung up and that were committed to, co to continuing that work. And so that that example of how an agile community oriented space that is an own that is collaboratively managed and collaboratively shared has the capacity to deal with even some of the most difficult crises that we can we can face in our, in our times of need next slide but what does this all mean now 
what, what I've done with this slide is I've taken two particular things that I that have struck me across the, the course of the time that I've been I've been with Respace. Now, one of them you can see is that beautiful picture of a mural that went up on the very first day of the hive, and and there in the maelstrom of pictures are the words "Be the change you want to see," and I think that's very clear now during a post-COVID environment where change will happen. This is an opportunity for us to make that change and to shape that change in a way that maybe puts paid to the spectres of Brexit, puts paid to, and deals with some of the issues that we are going to see as the climate changes, which is one of the bigger problems that we face as a, as a species. We are at a crossroads right now. And the reason I have put this other uh, testimonial, I guess, from, from Shaz Nawaz, who is a, a Labour leader and a councillor in uh, Peterborough, who actually was the person who gifted us um, a giant space in Peterborough to, to prove that our work could be transported. And his um, his testimonial, obviously, it's very nice and it says lots of lovely things, but what I've picked it out for is because what he says and what I believe firmly is never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Now, there's not going to be any going back to normal. There's, there's almost no real definition of that word anyway. And we are often told, and we're talking now about building back better, but it's important to understand what building back better might mean. Does it, it, the people who build our environment, the people who develop the buildings, who, who build the streets, who create the housing, Without in, integrating everybody, without integrating communities with developers, with councils, with authorities, we're not going to be able to build back better in a way that will help everyone, that will benefit everyone. And yet that opportunity exists for us now. And we believe that we have got a system that is capable of kickstarting that. Next slide. And it's actually my last slide, because we've been doing this for you know for five years now, and we've been working with developers, and we've been working in areas across London and in other areas. And 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 what we've seen is that there is a huge drive towards place making, and that was something that existed before this pandemic, and it's something that people are still very keen to do because it's a way of regenerating areas, turn them into locations that people are proud to be in, people are proud to come to. Now, I would like to introduce a concept. Respace has been working on this for a while, as I say, and that concept is a new phase of the regeneration process, a phase that we've been calling the pre-generation. Now, in, in any building context, there is a time scale between the time a decision is made that something needs to be regenerated and the time that that regeneration process actually begins the time that the spades hit the ground, when the decisions have been made as to what needs to be built. And in that phase, in that period of time, there are community consultations and there are discussions and there are you know, financial um, negotiations that take place. But this is also a phase where we have seen with the amount of resources and space and um, you know, as, as people are moving out of an area and new people are moving into an area with the flow of, of uh, different types of people, there is a massive opportunity in this phase to enable innovation and creativity to actually push back against gentrification and the, the negative sides of gentrification where people are pushed away from an area. But rather than that, by giving access to the space, by giving access to some of these resources, by linking all of these communities together, you can create a phase, you can, you can create a recovery phase where the people of that area, the businesses, can, can innovate together, can work together for their own mutual resilience, for their own mutual benefit. And by doing so, can have a footprint and an imprint upon the developments and upon the areas that they live in, assuring and guaranteeing to those councils and to those developers that they will have and they will create products, developments that are that are, that are popular, that people want to live in, that people of all types, that are varied. 
would love to live in. And we are embarking upon over the next six months, a new project, a project we're calling Recover, the pre-generation project, where we will be working with a number of major partners of different types, more information about who they are is available later. But we'll be working with a number of major partners to renovate and rejuvenate spaces in their development, to bring together art and culture and use that as a tool by which various different components of society can communicate and work together to produce a phase, a time of recovery, a time for us all to be able to have a bit of breathing space and a bit of thinking time. And that's it. Thank you so much, G. That was really, really informative. And I love, uh, I thought that was a really beautiful introduction to what is a very, it's both a very rich, but it's also a very rigorous approach, which I just think is, is really vital right now. Um, if people have questions, it would be lovely to put them in the Q&A. Uh, that's open or to raise your hand. Actually, I'm not sure I can see the audience. Let me see if I can. Um, nope. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, in the hope that we have some questions, I, there's a couple of things I'd like. It's I'd like to follow up. One is um, uh, I think what's really interesting is that there's a kind of there's a there's a kind of conceptual framework and there's a position, and then I think what you're brilliant at is to is applying that in this way where we can actually see real change on the ground. So I wondered if you could talk just a little bit more about the notion of the commons, which I think you mentioned briefly, but I think there's been, there's quite a lot of, uh, there's a kind of increasing interest, I think, in, in planning and in um, architecture, for example, in the notion of the commons. I don't know if you were willing to talk a little bit more about that. I would love to. So. <laughs> So the, the commons is a really interesting is a really interesting concept because I don't know if you're aware, but Robert Jenrick has recently um, created a, a, a new bit of uh, an extension to a bit of law that is packaged in a new way that kind of gives communities the right to regenerate, the right to talk to you know talk about empty buildings, to have first purchase options on you know disused space, and to use it as some form of commons. And the idea of commons has obviously existed for a long time in the physical world and has recently become a, a buzzword in the digital world. But what is really key is that the commons comes with a commons understanding of how to use it and how to share it. Now, that's something that, you know, I've been working in this environment now for seven to ten years. That's something which I don't see any training for. I don't see any you know, guidebooks on how to share and stuff. The last time I remember, I remember anyone teaching me how to share was when I was watching Sesame Street, <laughs> which was only last Thursday. No, that's not true, actually. It was, <laughs> it was quite a while ago. But the, my point is there is that fundamentally the, the idea that we have access to a space but no necessary set of commons and understood rules on how to use that space, commons ethics. And that's fine if you're in a village in the back end of nowhere and nobody new comes to your area with new ideas and, and crazy new ways who hasn't heard about what you do it kind of works but once you're talking about global environments and a mix of cultures where people just behave in slightly different ways and, and see things in different ways a, a, a profound principled set of ethics of sharing is very very is, is key it's very important and without financial imperative because that's where corporate capitalism, commercialism has always had an advantage because it has a simple set of rules. Make money or bugger off. That's quite a simple set of rules. And fundamentally, that's not how commons works. Commons might be make some food this week, uh, make a barn, make a, 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 I don't know, a tractor factory or something. You know, there's a different set of rules. It's based on need. And so when as, as our work has, has progressed, what we found is that we've, we found that we're essentially creating a kind of set of commons ethics, a kind of set of rules about the ways in which people and organizations could potentially share spaces in a way that benefits them, benefits the owner, benefits each other. That's fantastic. Yeah, I'm, uh, 
I've been having other conversations with people. I think it's in a way it's grown out. You know, it's been things, as you say, that you've been involved in for a while. And uh, but but the pandemic has really focused us, I think, on mutual aid and on different ways of working, which I think the Commons is a really interesting one. Um, I'm getting in some questions. So uh, there's one from uh, Hayley Squires that I'm also going to slightly adapt because I think it's a question that I'm very interested in. And it is you've talked a lot about. Uh, things from the community perspective, which I think is really vital, but it's also in terms of people who have ownership of buildings or property developers or have other relationships like charities, you say, or um, local authorities. Um, in terms of the process by which somebody might work with you in terms of a building in a transitional phase when it's empty and not in use, but also how, um, as Haley asks, how does it when it's when it's due to go back to be redeveloped, then uh, how does that happen? Too, what's the kind of timescales? What's the the process from the building owner's point of view? Well, I mean, I think the the, the idea behind respace is that we wanted to make this a a really simple decision, like almost like a no brainer. You know, take all the effort, take all the stress, take all the mitigate all the risk. So that fundamentally, from a building owner's perspective, this just seems, this should just be a really simple, easy, beneficial thing that they do when their spaces are empty. So that process really should be as simple as the owner simply getting in contact with you know a member of their their local alliance um, or respace directly, and simply saying that we have this potential space, and then we would with them um, with the alliance members in that local area curate a fantastic group that will potentially come up with a proposal for that space that proposal will be shown to the to the landlord to the owner if it suits the kind of remit of what they're trying to do then then all systems go it's a very fast very smooth way that an owner for example i mentioned shaz nawaz from peterborough um who's a, you know the, the the leader of the labor party there i think it took 15 minutes from the moment we sat down at, you know, in front of a cafe to the point at which we were basically shaking hands on, on a new project. It's, it's a very, very easy, simple process using bits of law that already exist to facilitate meanwhile groups, to facilitate organizations to temporarily use space. It's just that those systems are in themselves exclusive and, and make it very difficult to share. So it's a it's a it's a way of getting of using a system, but also getting around that system. And from the developer's point of view, the benefit is the risks are mitigated. More importantly, because everything is pre-planned, pre-arranged, and and designed bespoke for their space for their timescale, it fits with the timescale. So once the project, once the time has finished, the project should be finished. And this is a very key uh, and a very important part of what we do, which I didn't put on the slides because I think in some ways it's just so, it's so vital and so relevant. We have a belief that you have to be very careful when trying to create sustainable solutions to problems. And what you have to be careful about is you don't also sustain those problems because your solution itself predicates on keeping itself going and therefore it's not in any incentive to solve the problem. We know this happens. We know this happens in the pharmaceutical industry, for example. We know that it happens in, in charitable situations. And so key part of our architecture is actually looking for solutions that solve problems within timescales. So that once, for example, take homelessness, it is a problem where you have 80,000 buildings in London that are sitting empty and 8,000 homeless people. So within 15 or 20 of those buildings, you can solve the problem of homelessness on a day-to-day, -day, week to week basis without it being a permanent solution, without it needing to be a permanent solution. Because ultimately no individual is permanently homeless. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And uh, a follow-up question, uh, I see it as a follow-up question from uh, Robert Young, um, who says, great initiative, G. The investment ownership of buildings, uh, investment and ownership of buildings is often disconnected with the local area. How do you see that longer term ownership ethics mission and sharing can filter to capital organizations so. You've talked about a one to one how people could just come to you, but in terms of do you have a sense of how this could be something that was really became part of a kind of. 
uh, just more general way in which uh, people with buildings thought about how they might use them in the yeah, totally step by step i mean it, you know it's it, the disconnection that, that exists between you know sort of um, you know large developments and, and local community groups is often really a logistical thing much more than it is a deliberate thing you know it's got to do with the, the you know the, the different ways that different types of communities communicate how differently that they might engage and certainly we see the alliance as being a really key tool a key network that developers can join can plug into and instantly have access at that moment whenever they have a building the, you know the dream here and it's a dream that is achievable within a few months of where we are today the dream is a developer would simply be able to log on jump onto their alliance membership system and simply say we've got this space has anyone got any great ideas for it and then the process of alliance members getting together and putting forward a proposal would would begin straight away and for those developers and for those owners i think the 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 fundamental benefits beyond just saving huge amounts of money you know which is a which is a fantastic benefit anyway but beyond that the fundamental benefit of being able to engage local communities engage small businesses means that your value the value of your property the value of your development increases many times over and proof of this is for example our landlord for the high michael gerard one of the the, the very last slide actually had a, a lovely photograph of the high when it was full of people from naomi klein's uh, this changes everything showing which was which was so packed that people were literally sitting on top of each other and then just some six months later it was luxury flats which in in some concept might be considered oh no that's terrible but actually it's not because fundamentally those flats will be giving houses to families for many, many, many years to come. And the important part is that rather than it being something that pushed away local communities, they became more desirable because it, you know, the space, the area itself had an increased footfall because the building itself had, a, had an improved reputation and an appeal that it had been the height. So I see that there are actually holistic benefits everywhere you look, and I'm not clever enough to know them all <laughs> but i do know that the system itself will benefit if that's what you're trying to to achieve yeah thank you very much did i did i answer that question all right yeah i i i think you did i'm um uh i mean i think for me uh as somebody who's you know come to this from an academic context and and because we you know one of the things we were looking at is what we a kind of online platform which we we kind of talked about like it's a kind of form of dating app basically it's a very quick way in which people who have a building can get together with the people who might make good use of that building or you know in this very um customized way and i still think that's really useful and i also i guess from my point of view part of being part of an alliance is that if we're talking about this being filtered across many more organizations um, who have control over buildings and on a property development, then uh, part of that is being a kind of ally, ally to the project and, and talking about it more widely and spreading, spreading the word, not just kind of leading it to you <laughs> to do that. So I feel like there's still a lot to be done in that area. Um, I've got another question I'm going to ask, and then we might come back to the Alliance, which is from Andrew Edkins. Thank you, Andrew. Um, he's asking a bit more about the pandemic as something that's actually adding to your mission. Uh, he's wondering what you think is happening to the attitudes of various parties involved. Do you think uh, that they're going to be more willing to share, which I think is what you implied, but I think potentially they might be less willing to share. People might get more uh, protective, for example. So I don't know what you think about that. About how I think a lot about it, actually, as it happens, because, um, you know, it, experience tells you that when there are situations like this, there are winners and there are losers, you know, and the tendency and the idea is that over the next few months, we I think we all understand there's going to be large mass unemployment. There's going to be uh, a surface, a surface of empty buildings floating around. There's going to be, you know, sort of, um, charitable stroke social organisations springing up left, right, and centre as people seek new ways to generate income, and and see that there is huge amounts of government and support funding available for a short period of time. So I think we're, you know, to try and have a bit of a 
a mid to longer term view on it is we'll see it at first this exact not sharing this kind of sharing not sharing what are we doing everyone just sort of grabbing what they can and seeing what they can make out of it phase we will see that happen and you know and it was something i was going to mention in, in relation to a previous point that you know what we were trying to create was a with with bartlett's and with respace was this kind of matching system but it was a matching system that actually has and and this is very key because matching systems for landlords to meet social organizations who might potentially need their space currently exist and there's probably one being developed every 25 minutes somewhere because it's a very simple technological thing to do you know dating apps and so on and so forth. matching is very easy to do digitally but the real world expression is fundamentally you've still got that same problem of the owner having to worry about whether the risk of giving their building to that organization is going to explode in their face the organization taking on the burden of facilitating buildings that they that may not necessarily be in particularly good working order and the cost of those and so what's really key is we know these things are going to happen and people will try but it's important that we keep going creating unique showcase projects like the recover project and the showcases that will come from it and that's something that you know we're, we're going to be building over the next six months but keep showing that this way of using buildings this way of landlords contacting multiple groups rather than just waiting for those groups who've signed on to that particular website and paid that particular website fee in the hopes of getting an empty building so that they can do what they need to do without necessarily realizing or appreciating that they might only use it nine to five but they'll be paying for it 24 7. you know and that kind of concept will take time to embed itself in society as we move forward but what we're talking about here is is a system of change a way that innovations and entrepreneurial spirit in different areas each time can create something which just makes it better which just makes it more feasible more beneficial for everyone to be involved this is an organic process and, and you know the temptation is to go at it all guns blazing hammer and tongs you know but the reality is is you know step by step it needs to be built but in a post-covid environment we can speed that up massively yeah, yeah. well and I, I've, I've been thinking a bit about um about this thing of risk aversion also because i've been working on another project um within me which is about um how we might use schools more effectively for social infrastructure again uh, definitely with um, issues around the pandemic kind of very central so the the kind of sets of reasons why schools as a, as a space that have a label a function but have a huge amount of wasted time when they're not being used as a resource and they have facilities you know just at that most basic level of facilities that could be used in the community and what's very clear i mean there are some issues at the level of kind of the government current understanding of what education is but uh, there's such a, a lot around really simple things like maintenance cleaning um, security that are preventing kind of just really stopping um, very simple possibilities from happening uh, and i don't know i think that's i mean it feels like you know, every time you do it, you're learning a lot about those very pragmatic issues that you can feed back to the building owners, I guess. No, totally. And I mean, it's, it's, it is those little pragmatic issues um, that often can be, can be the, the difference between success and failure for an organisation, an organisation that's well resourced or has access to lots of funding, lots of resources, can, can overcome these obstacles. But if, if they don't have access to those resources, as we've seen with a number of even, even big organizations, we can see that that eventually becomes a drain, not only for that organization, also for the landlord. And so this sharing concept might seem alien at first, but it is, it's safer, you know, mitigated costs, mitigated risk, and the benefit of being able to work in a curated group with other groups that have similar ambitions and ideals. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, well, you know that I agree with that. Um, well, it's obvious, isn't it, really? It's just how did you, how do you get it to work has always been the key. And I think by trying to financially model it, because, you know, my background was in, in financial modelling, was in business 
generation business creation. And um, you know, I think I understand it quite well. Um, but in certain scenarios, like I mentioned with the commons, by trying to bring a financial modeling mentality to a system that doesn't necessarily, or to, a, to an environment that doesn't necessarily all think the same way, you're right, you're forcing everybody to think a certain way, which is kind of undermining their ability to be entrepreneurial and creative and to, to use resources that are being wasted in, in a, you know, and to, to, to unlock them. Yeah. Yeah, and I think for me, um, the, that kind of inno innovation and inventiveness in the current climate is really, I don't just mean with the pandemic, is really interesting and uh, productive because my background, you know, is in community action in the 1980s and squatting and, and the kind of sort of things that were possible, particularly in London, although in a lot of other big cities across the UK, um, because there was a lot of vacant space, because it, the, it was not... Um, a city, London was not a city where where um, everything was kind of so overdeveloped and the pressure and the, the property values and the land prices were so extreme that you couldn't um, do quite a lot of inventive things. So for me, I don't know, it'd be good to hear your, you know, that's, the situation is so different in terms of what is well, I, I mean, maybe I'd be interested. Do you think the situation is, is very different in terms of what's possible and how you make things happen? I, th I think it's different, but the same, uh, interestingly, is in, in as much as it, it's different because the environments are different and the pressures are different. And so, as you say, back then in the 80s and in the 90s, you know, there were loads of empty commercial buildings. There were loads of empty private buildings of people who left them. And, and so the the opportunity there was much less regulation around the usages of these buildings there was much less in terms of suing there was much less risk you know if things went wrong because you know the idea that you could just sue because you got a scratch on the top of your head from you know I mean, from banging your head on a door or something like that and you know that that wasn't really fully embedded in british culture at that time but ultimately what makes them the same is it actually just comes down to resources and you know, I'm a very practical person and I'm resource orientated. And, you know, during the during the 80s, the resources were a little bit more plentiful. There weren't money. I mean, there was a lot of money flowing around in the 80s. Let's face it. It was one of the, you know, the, it was a very, um, it, was, it was that kind, you know, loads of money, that kind of era. Um, so there was a lot of money floating around. There were empty buildings because people were buying them and they were quite cheap and they didn't know what to do with it, but they knew it would go up in, you know, in time and so on. Um, and so there were a lot of resources available. And then, you know, it seemed like a lot of those resources had been claimed over the last 15, 20 years, but what's become apparent, and it's actually the digital, you know, it's, it's access to the internet that, that almost like brings it back to that sudden capacity for us to be able to see abundant resources. Because now we're all connected in a way that we can see, well, all right, this person has got this much waste over in, I don't know, um newcastle or whatever and this person needs that precise thing in durham and this person's got an empty building in sheffield and there's 15 groups just around you know in the hallam area who really need do you know what i mean we are now suddenly in a position where there the claiming of resources has gone up you know virtually everything on this planet is owned by somebody somewhere now do you know what i mean even pretty much air that we breathe someone claimed it's like a flag and it gone that's ours but the wastage from that means that actually secretly all those resources are still there and all those resources are still available and they're just getting 40 percent of our food chucked in the bin we're just buying clothes from primark every thursday and throwing away on saturday you know and it's like their the resources itself we still have access to them and the world will still always have access to them it's just who actually owns them who uses them that seemed to have changed so i think massive opportunity exists now for us to be able to unlock these abundant resources. You know, knowledge now, given that we can just jump onto YouTube and completely learn how to fly an Apache helicopter in 25 minutes or whatever it is, knowledge now is such a transferable and shareable resource. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a fantastic point. I think it's actually, it's a really good point to end on that, uh, 
yeah, from, you know, me, I immediately feel of London as something that's really kind of hypersaturated and really full and very difficult to, to find opportunities and gaps. And I think what's really wonderful about you and about the work of Respace is just what you've said. Those gaps are there. The waste is there. The resources are there. We just have to stop wasting them and use them in much more productive ways. I will give you a perfect example to finish with. So I'm cycling around Regent's Park the other day. All right. Now, around Regent's Park, it's one of the plushest, most beautiful parts of London. You know, gigantic mansion-like buildings that I have never seen empty. But equally, I've never seen used in all of this time until I cycled around it this last week. And I only saw, it was evening, I saw two lights on in the entire circuit of Regent's Park. What that means is all of those buildings all of those spaces are not being used in a very efficient way. Perhaps they were only being used by international students before. Perhaps they were only being used by ambassadors or very rich people who could only come over once every six weeks, but they had someone come and switch the lights on every day for them. That's all changed. All of the illusions of how things were gone. Do you know what I mean? You just need to cycle around and you can see the waste, the space, the time, the knowledge, the people who are sitting on street corners who could probably fix all your problems in 45 minutes, but they just sat there doing, doing nothing because, you know, we're all stuck in lockdown and jobs are going and so on. So I do think it's a case of just switching your vision. Fantastic. Thank you so much, G. I've really enjoyed hearing you uh, this lunchtime and thank you to everybody for coming um, and uh, yeah, and anybody who's got an empty building, yes. anybody, any developer or, you know, anybody who's got large chunks of space who would like right now to be involved in our recover project, which has, you know, uh, partnerships from all types of fantastic organizations, most of which I won't name drop now, but you know, they're, they're, you know, they're very suitable for what we're doing. Jump on board, get in contact, get in contact with me direct. Let's talk about getting some showcases up and running in different areas. Um, you know, there is no G at respaceprojects.org written there, but imagine it is. And it's there. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Bye bye.